The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, why the nation's largest union of registered nurses is fighting for single-payer health care. Plus, why conservatives are so quick to cry socialism. And Bill Press on journalism and the Mueller investigation. No apologies needed. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Nurses are on the front line of medical care in our nation. And from that position, they see the failure of a system that leaves millions uninsured. Melinda Markowitz explains why Medicare for All is such a personal issue for nurses and why they're campaigning to insure all Americans. And we say hello to Melinda Markowitz, co-president of the California Nurses Association and a member of National Nurses United. She's a retired registered nurse with 40 years under her belt and was most recently at Good Samaritan Hospital in San Jose, California. Melinda Markowitz, thank you for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, it's certainly... Well, and certainly our pleasure, too, to have you with us. Medicare for all. There's our topic of conversation today. Why is Nurses United taking such a strong stand on the issue? Well, as nurses, we see the effects of our broken health care system. It's too expensive. It is not sustainable. And it is um, not giving the patients the care that they need. Well, what are some of the things that, that you see every day as a nurse that, that would compel you to fight the fight? Oh, there's many. Um, well, uh, one of the things that we're seeing um, more of is patients coming in with a stroke or a heart, or heart attack um, because their uh, blood pressure is out of control. Um, most of the time you'll see that they can't afford their medications or they'll take it, um, they don't take it at all or they take it every other day. And um, the doctor orders a specific amount of um, medication and often they just can't do it because they're deciding whether to take their medicine or to buy food or to buy um, go get gas to go to work. And sometimes because of the horrible cost of health care today, um, it, it's deciding that, you know, they have to do these other things. And it's so wrong. And these things are really preventable. Um, we also see patients that come into the hospital, they have diabetes, and they come in very ill. Um, their blood sugars are high. They have fevers because when we do our assessment, we notice that they have a huge sore um, on their legs. And, it's, uh, and often we see that they have to have him amputated because, again, they can't afford the insulin, which is extremely high. They can't afford uh, the equipment that they need. And, um, again, this is totally uh, avoidable. And you even hear about people heading to Mexico or heading to Canada to get the medicines that they, that they do need and that are much more yeah. affordable. Yeah, th that is very true. And uh, they sometimes go and have surgical procedures and then come back to the United States with major complications. So um, Medicare for All is so much needed. Mm -hmm. Well, Nurses United, as I mentioned, supporting Medicare for All, the Medicare for All Act of 2019, which was introduced by Representative Pramila Jayapal of Washington. What are the important advantages of this legislation? Oh, there's so many. You know, it's a gold standard and it's actually a comprehensive health care. It goes from primary care, um, hospital, outpatient services, dental, vision, women's reproductive 
uh, long-term services, uh, prescription drugs, um, health care. And it's really based on the needs of the patient, and it guarantees quality of care, um, not providing uh, less care or rationing. Um, it gets rid of premiums. You have no deductibles, no co-pays, no out-of-pocket ex- uh, expenses, and you really have the freedom to choose your own doctor, your own hospital, um, specialty care. No one um, will be the gatekeeper. You can go and see anyone that you want. Your California chapter is campaigning in support of SB 562. Tell us about that bill and, and how the campaign is doing. Well, we're still um, pushing for uh, a Medicare um, for all in California. Um, like anything, uh, you know, you have obstacles, but we are uh, still 100% committed um, to uh, a Medicare for all in California. But now we are, you know, focusing um, at this point, since we have the federal bill um, that we're going all for all forward on this, um, the other thing is we have 30 million Americans that are underinsured or excuse me, we have 30 million Americans that are uninsured and at least 40 million more that can't afford um, the cost of the premiums, the co-pays and the deductibles. And this is why this is the most ridiculous and sad thing about our health care system is why we're seeing more GoFundMe accounts to raise money for their bills. And also, we're seeing um, people filing bankruptcy because of the um, medical cost. And the life expectancy in the United States is lower than any other nation. And while also our infant mortality rate is much higher than other nations. And this is this is sinful. This is you know we have to change our system. Yeah, and and we should point out that of of the industrialized nations, you know, there are plenty of them that they're not, you know, there's tyrannic socialist regimes that, or, or whatever. You know, we're talking about Canada. We're talking about places all over Europe where it's national health care and everyone's taken care of and everyone gets everything that they need. Right, right, and it's really a shame uh, that we can't have that for our American people in the United States. And actually, we could. But, you know, it, there there has to be the will of our elected officials. And right now, 70% of our Americans want Medicare for all. And um, I think that um, they need to listen to us, and we're making sure that um, they do. We're speaking with Melinda Markowitz, who is co-president of the California Nurses Association and member of National Nurses United. She's a retired registered nurse with over 40, with 40 years under her belt. Um, and, you know, Melinda, there is the critique of single payer that it is, is that transitioning to single payer is too dramatic. It's too complicated and unwieldy. As someone who works in health care and has seen all the things that you've seen in your 40 years, how do you respond to that? Oh, well, nurses have been on the front lines for decades, and this is really deeply personal for all registered nurses in the United States. We see firsthand the struggles our patients go through trying to afford their health care, and people are literally sick and dying from our current broken system. And so Medicare for All would simplify the health care system, Uh, It will reduce the hundreds of billions of dollars wasted on administrative cost um, uh, because of our current ineffective multi-payer system. This legislation prevents providers from using payments um, from this program to benefit their profits and marketing. And the most important thing, I think, or one of many important things, is we would save $2 trillion over 10 years. And and the other thing is Medicare now is working for the seniors. So this is going to just be expanding it but improving on Medicare. Now, of course, there are opponents that see Medicare for All as an extreme left-wing proposal. How do you see it? Oh, well, that's absolutely not true, and I think it's 
you know, just people that for whatever reason don't want people to really have health care. But this is supported by uh, both parties. And like I had said earlier, 70% of Americans want the Medicare for all. And this is really about saving lives and, and having health care be a right, not a privilege. Amen to that. Melinda Markowitz, co-president of the California Nurses Association, member of National Nurses United, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast to talk about Medicare for all and where it's going on the national level as well as at the state level in California. Melinda, thank you so much for your time with us today. Wishing you the best of luck and hopefully we can hear back from you again soon. Oh, I, I would be my pleasure and thank you again so much. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This Social Security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, why even Eisenhower could be called socialist by today's conservative standards. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. It's shocking, I tell you. Shocking that some millionaires and billionaires would brazenly lie and cheat to weasel their undeserving children into prestigious colleges, displacing more qualified students. Where do these privileged ones get the idea that truth doesn't matter, that they can just make up facts and corrupt the whole system for their personal advantage? Try the economic report of the president, issued only a week after the college admissions scandal made the news. These annual forecasts of our economy's performance have become little more than hooked-up presidential image pieces, but even by partisan PR standards, Trump's report is shamelessly grandiose, replete with flagrant fabrications of facts and fraudulent claims of achievement. In particular, this report tried to pass off his $2017 trillion corporate tax break as a mighty engine of growth for the working class. Speaking in the ecstatic tongue of voodoo sorcerers, the Trumpsters insist that their massive tax giveaway is producing a surge in corporate investment that abracadabra creates jobs and pay hikes. Only, there's been no investment surge. Corporate chieftains simply pocketed Trump's handout. When verbal lies don't work, economic scoundrels resort to dazzling graphics to give a visual appearance of progress. Thus, the Trump report has a dandy chart of deception with a bright line streaking dramatically upward to show the economic impact of his bold infrastructure plan. Of course, the graphic would be more convincing if he had actually proposed such a plan. But he's made no such effort, so the whole scheme is, as economist Paul Krugman called it, voodoo squared. This is Jim Hightower saying, When top leaders lie so blatantly for their own gain... We can't really be surprised that other narcissists will take it as moral permission to do exactly the same. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy to swallow pill for you the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, 
even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to Hightowerlowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Chuck Collins is a leading voice on inequality in America. He says that years of a right-wing drift in American politics means that even the most popular strategies for leveling the playing field get labeled socialist today, and democracy is paying the price. And we say hello to Chuck Collins, who is the director of the Inter- Institute for Policy Studies program on inequality and the common good. Also, the author of a popular book, Born on Third Base, a one percenter makes the case for tackling inequality, bringing wealth home and committing to the common good. He also has a new book, Is Inequality in America Irreversible? And when he's not busy writing books, he also co-edits inequality.org. Chuck Collins, thanks for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Our pleasure to have you with us. Uh, So you recently wrote an article that caught our eye. It's titled Bring Back Eisenhower Socialism. How could anyone see Eisenhower, in your words, as a crafty pinko? Well, I think the irony is that today, by today's Republican standards, a lot of things that President Dwight Eisenhower stood for, uh, uh, policies that, 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 he, uh, that existed under his administration, would be considered far left. So it shows how far to the right the Republican Party has moved, that even the uh, you know, domestic policies of President Dwight Eisenhower would be considered pink or socialist. Now, in his time, I, not that I'm aware of anyway, Eisenhower's colleagues did not object to him as a socialist. Is this as simple as perhaps party politics? In other words, you call a policy socialist if it's Democrat, but not if it's Republican? Well, I think coming out of the Depression and through the New Deal and World War II, there was there was a stronger bipartisan understanding that we we had to temper the, the excesses of unrestrained capitalism, that uh, you know, capitalism needs some guideline, guide rails, if you will. Uh, it needs to be rules-based. Um, and unfortunately, I, what I notice is that uh, you know, the, the, the current Republican Party has become kind of the party of hyper-individualistic extract of capitalism. Uh, they, they've embraced a kind of flavor of completely anarchic, unregulated capitalism. And so from that perspective, anything you do to limit excess, to limit, uh, you know, wage theft, to regulate corporate behavior is considered, uh, you know, unacceptable. And I think that's what's changed. You write about another time when the socialist attack was was mounted in the 1960s when Medicare was created. How was the program able to overcome all the fear mongering? Well, that's a good question. I mean, in some ways, it's just important to acknowledge that for the last hundred years, we've had red scares. I mean, a hundred years ago, after World War I, uh, there was the red scare that was the result of the progressive movement, which was essentially pushing radical ideas like child labor laws uh, and that sort of thing. And then after World War II, we had uh, the McCarthyism red scare, which was, again, to kind of police back and push back on some of the New Deal policies. And, you know, Medicare walked into that. But, the, but the, I think what changed by the 1960s was there was a national war on poverty. People understood that this was a program that was going to reduce elder poverty, that there was something wrong with, you know, at the time, one out of four, you know, elders did not have access to health insurance. Um, and so I think that the practicality of Medicare uh, overcame the fear mongering. And in the end, even the Republicans who were talking about socialized medicine backed down. They just understood this was a reasonable reform, that it wasn't creeping socialism. We're speaking with Chuck Collins, director of IPS's program on inequality and the common good. He also co edits inequality.org. Chuck, Medicare for all is the new target. It's, it's everyone's favorite thing to go after now. And it does feel like we're, we're sliding backwards, of course. What's your response to critics who call it socialized medicine? 
Well, you know, it, it's the old playbook coming out. Uh, they, the, the, the people calling it that don't really have an alternative except to go back to kind of an anarchic, uh, you know, everyone dog eat dog kind of healthcare system. And I think most people now realize that, you know, other civilized countries have universal health care, uh, that we as people from the United States pay way more for our health care than other countries and get considerably less benefits. And that that's because there's this huge for-profit money grab taking money out of the healthcare care system uh, that could be used in, in caring and, you know, ensuring the well-being of our people. So uh, it's it's not surprising that it's come up. But again, here's an idea that is wildly popular. You know, it, it, Medicare has worked well for millions of people. Why wouldn't we expand it as a sort of foundation for children and for adults? And it's a way that people can envision a path forward. Um, and the reality is we may still have a private insurance system and we may have, you know, other aspects of the existing insurance system. And there's a whole transition to how do you move to a new system. But all of that, it's part of a healthy democratic debate and the problem with calling it socialism is its attempt to just shut down healthy discussion, which we really sorely need. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, you mentioned the popularity of it, and that goes across party lines. I mean, it's it's popular across the board, and but as soon as you throw in that word socialism, it becomes evil. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the you know the 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 red nightmare in American history is an attempt to shut down a way of way of thinking. It's just saying you can't think over that line. You can't imagine over that line. And part of it's people, people, you know, we, we have an image of socialism, which is conflated with communism, which is conflated with Stalinism. So it's like, okay, here's your choice. You can have gulag, you know, socialism, or you can have plutocracy. Which one would you like? You know, like that, as if those are the only two flavors that we're, we're allowed to consider. And I think the good news is it's Baskin and Robbins, 31 flavors. There's lots of ways to organize an economy and a public sector to both have a vibrant free market and have a healthy populace. Mm -hmm. Increasing taxes on the rich is another policy I think we should take a moment to discuss here. Some very rich people support the idea. Are they socialists? No, you know, what's interesting is that, uh, and again, the, these ideas, some of the ideas that have been po proposed, like Senator Warren's wealth tax, uh, Senator Sanders' proposal to uh, uh, have a more robust inheritance tax, um, the idea of a higher income tax on incomes over, you know, $10 million. These are all wildly popular ideas, including with Republicans, uh, and including with very, some high net worth individuals, the, the Patriotic Millionaires Network, you know, Richard Branson, you know, the, the came out and said, you know, the wealthy should pay more. They are not socialists so much as they understand that a healthy democratic society needs to both have adequate revenue, but it also needs to slow or put a break on the concentration of wealth and power at the top. And that that's becoming a threat. We're, we're at risk of becoming kind of a plutocratic, oligarchic, society dominated by billionaires and, and a generation from now dominated by their children. And, and I think it doesn't take a lot of imagination to, to say, well, that's not a good thing. We don't want to go down that road. Uh, and so it's interesting to see business leaders stepping up who care about healthy capitalism, but also concerned about extreme inequality. Mm -hmm. You know, the word socialism, I almost feel like we need to go back take people back to a dictionary and define it properly um, because it's tossed around so loosely today. How damaging is that label of socialism today? Well, I think it's real damage is, is how it limits our political conversation. Uh, and it's designed to do that. And uh, I do think, uh, you know, people embrace, sometimes people say, well, I'm an anti-capitalist. And I'm kind of like, well, what does that mean? You know, uh, it, it, the, the conversation is as confused about what is capitalism as what is socialism. And I think it is helpful to realize, like, you know, uh, in the Nordic countries, these are cap capitalist societies. They have vibrant free market societies like Finland and Sweden and Denmark. 
but they have elements of what you could call democratic socialism, which is they also have a strong social safety net. They have universal health insurance. Uh, they have progressive tax systems. Um, they are pro-work societies, not people don't, you know, aren't just sitting around in hammocks all day. They, the whole focus is getting people into work. So that's one type of capitalist slash democratic socialist society. Uh, is Canada a socialist society? I don't think so, but it has social medicine. It has housing, the larger percentage of housing that's outside the speculative market, but it might be locally owned. It isn't necessarily owned by the federal government. So it, the biggest cost is it just limits our imagination. It also keeps us from seeing what we already have, which are, you know, some people might consider socialist, but, you know, to have, in, I, I sit in Boston, 30% of our housing is in some form of nonprofit ownership, public housing, but also nonprofit ownership. Uh, is that socialism? No, it's a way to ensure that there's a certain amount of affordable housing uh, for people who are not rich. That's a good thing. Uh, people don't have to compete in the private market for a basic human need like housing. So, so I hope we can, uh, it's important you're having the conversation because uh, it just helps us navigate this terrain. How, how do you get through to those that only see, you know, they see, you think the word socialism, they, they automatically think Soviet style tyranny when they hear the word. How do you explain to folks that, you know, I mean, do you, do you just point to other countries and say, you know, this is democratic socialism? When, in other words, you can have your cake and eat it too. You just need to understand that. Yeah, I think, I think that uh, part of it is to try to help people understand other societies are organized in different ways that we could learn from, you know? Um, there's a terrific book called The Nordic Theory of Everything, uh, which is about, you know, what is it like in life in Finland? There's another book called The Year of Living Danishly, uh, Michael Moore made an interesting movie called Where to Invade Next, which is kind of a terrible title, but uh, it's actually a great movie, maybe I think his best movie, about what we could learn from other societies, how they're organized. So I think, I, I think the invitation is, you know, let go of this kind of dated, rigid image of gulag socialism, like, okay, we're coming for your TV and your toothbrush, and there's, you're not going to own anything privately. It's all going to be owned by the state, you know, like that, that sort of gulag image uh, is one, it was, you know, a period of Soviet uh, communism that no one wants to exemplify, no one wants to replicate. Uh, and that, you know, there's all kinds of different socialisms, just like there's all kinds of capitalisms. And uh, we should be looking for what's best for, for our society and not get stuck in labels. Chuck Collins, director of the Institute for Policy Studies program on inequality and the common good. He also co-edits inequality.org, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Chuck, we appreciate your time with us today, and we look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thanks a lot for having me. It's been our pleasure. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs> We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press with Parker Malloy of Media Matters for America on the right-wing call for media apologies in the wake of the Mueller report. We welcome uh, to the studio uh, for the remainder of the show here, the next 35 minutes or so, uh, Parker Malloy is uh, editor over editor-at-large over at the great Media Matters for America. Hey, Parker, hey. nice to see you. It is great to be here. We are glad to provide some uh, studio space and a microphone for you today to step up to the microphone sure. and to apologize to Donald Trump uh, and uh, the <laughs> Trump administration 
for all the bad things you said about him during the Mueller investigation that we now know was uh, totally, um, you know, uh, a, a, a real witch hunt, as Donald Trump as, said. As he is no doubt owed an apology. <laughs> um, which the, the funny thing is that's actually something that when um, – what, what was it? Rudy Giuliani went on uh, Chris Cuomo's show on, on CNN and at one point he stopped – Stop the show and and uh-huh. said, apologize for this before we go any further. <laughs> apologize. And it's just so bizarre to see all of that at play. It's it's <laughs> it feels so childish. It feels so petty, and especially jumping to this so quickly. You know, we're, we're we were t- 12 hours out from when Barr's letter came out and you already had um, the messaging, which started at the White House. You had Kellyanne Conway and. Uh, Rudy Giuliani and Sarah Sanders out there saying that the media owes Trump an apology. And then you see that same message echoed across conservative media. You you see uh, Tucker Carlson, Sean, Sean Hannity had a 26 minute rant <laughs> uh, to open his to open his show on Monday. And uh, where that was, that was the theme that people should apologize. And when you when you look at, uh, you know, if you if you think about it, Sean Hannity was the number one uh, proponent of this Seth Rich conspiracy theory that he kept going and he was basically dragging Seth Rich's family through, th- you know, through through hell, you know, trying trying to make that, um, you know, trying trying to create this kind of conspiracy theory. So it's it's kind of funny seeing them now standing up for the in- integrity in journalism. Uh, yeah. Well, well, the uh, and Peter, while we're talking, maybe you could pull uh, that Sarah Huckabee Sanders yesterday. Remember when she was uh, saying the media should be uh, uh, ashamed just to hear that again. But um, my question is first, like, apologize for what? Exactly. I. I mean, yeah. okay. Oh, here we go. This is Sarah Huckabee Sanders yesterday uh, outside the briefing room, of course, because we don't have briefings anymore. Uh, after she'd finished talking to Fox, she talked to reporters. I think Democrats and the liberal media should be absolutely embarrassed by their behavior over the last two years in their breathless reporting and their hope. It's not just that they reported and spread a slanderous, malicious lie, but they hoped for the takedown of the president of the United States. Well, again, apologize for what? Apologize for reporting that the Justice Department was conducting a criminal investigation into the president of the United States, which was started by members of the Justice Department, not by the Clinton campaign. In fact, and and the special counsel appointed by people that Donald Trump had appointed to head the Justice Department. Could could you imagine if they if if they just didn't cover this? Yeah, right. <laughs> if, if there was no coverage, no reporting, I, I think. Or we're supposed to apologize for the, for reporting that the president's campaign manager. Yeah was found guilty in two different courts of multiple crimes for which he's going to spend, you know, eight or ten years or whatever it is in prison, or apologize for reporting that the president's personal attorney said the president lied when he said he knew nothing about hush money payments to Stormy Daniels, and the president lied when he said he was not doing business deals with for a new hotel in, uh, in Moscow all during the time of the campaign for which Michael Cohen is going to jail, too. So we're, we're, we weren't supposed to report on no. any of that. Got to got to focus more on tax cuts and the economy. <laughs> that's 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 their big message. That you're, oh, the media keeps downplaying his accomplishments and this and that. But <clears throat> I, I I don't <laughs> I, I have a hard time taking taking that sort of instruction seriously. That 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 media shouldn't report something. But I think one thing that's important to note here is that. Uh, in in a lot of this criticism, people seem to be confusing uh, opinion pieces with reporting. And I've tried to ask people what which stories were wrong that shouldn't have been reported. And for the most part, it was that they didn't like a contributor who was on CNN or MSNBC or but something the like that. The contributor is not a CNN anchor, right, right? Exactly. And in the in cases where reporters have made mistakes. Uh, you've they've been punished. What was it? Uh, CNN ended up firing three, th- three, th- th- three of their th- editors. Yeah. I think. Yeah, for exactly. One of, forget what the post was, but yeah, it was something involving Scaramucci and 
Russian banks or something like that. But they, those three people lost their jobs. So there are price, there is a price to pay when people do screw up. But you can't go after, you know, uh, Jennifer Rubin writing an opinion column at the Washington Post for being too hard on, you know, on Donald Trump, which right. uh, seeing Sean Hannity describe her as, as a far but, left. Yeah. Uh, you know, writer but, is is one thing, but yeah. But I mean, yeah, I think they would have been happier if if um, and Sarah said this says this that whenever there is a briefing and that said when there were briefings, would say it all the time. Why aren't you, why aren't you talking about our bill on tax cuts or something? Or why aren't you talking about bum bum? Why are you talking about the Mueller report? Well, again, this is the president of the United States who is under investigation for potential serious crimes against this country um, and an investigation that um, we, we gave the numbers yesterday issued 2,800 subpoenas, um, executed 500 search warrants, uh, interviewed 500 witnesses, indicted 34 individuals, including six top members of Donald Trump's team. This is a big story. Pretty big. So, yeah. Hello. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, I think a big part of this is the fact that the goalposts kept moving, too. It started with, oh, mm -hmm. Russia didn't have anything to do with the election. And now and then, you know, if you look at how people are talking about this now, it's, oh, well, of course, Russia did something with the election. But did Trump know that that shouldn't be the standard of whether something's newsworthy, whether or not Donald Trump personally knew of, uh, you know, issues affecting the election and I think that one of the uh, one of the biggest mistakes is that people accept this idea that um, that Russian involvement was uh, some Facebook posts or just some social media posts or something like that but it's really if you think about it the um, you know the the leaked DNC emails and the leaked Podesta emails that was a giant story that held on from about July onward. So that took up a lot of space. That was that was something that, in the in the final uh, in the in the final month of the campaign, on the trail, Donald Trump was mentioning it constantly because it was a powerful story. And that's when when I think of R Russian involvement, uh, that's the story I think about. I don't think about forty thousand dollars in Facebook ads or something mm -hmm. something along those lines. I think of the fact that. This story and the timed slow release was essentially a way to hack the media. It was a way to dictate coverage. It was a way to divert things away whenever he was facing a tough story. Um, as you saw the day that the Access Hollywood tape was released, immediately Wiki WikiLeaks came out with something to try to try to divert attention away from that. Right. So that that was a big deal, and I think that it's it's certainly worth covering. Fox seems to be. It's not just the White House, but Fox seems to be. No surprise. Um, doing the work of the White House in terms of retaliation against um, some of the other cable networks and some individuals, Rachel Maddow particularly, yes, yes. Uh, targeted by saying. You know. Yeah, that, uh, that that was no surprise. And I, and I, I mean, it, it always... Uh, and again, Rachel does her homework. Yeah, she knows her facts I, and she just lays it out there. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, obviously I, she, she has opinions mm -hmm. and she puts puts them forth, but... I I don't see how someone can take issue with Rachel Maddow, but but not see anything wrong with Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson or Lou Dobbs or any number or Laura of people. Ingram. I mean, yeah. if you talk about the opinionated, yeah. that's what you have in prime time right. on Fox. People all have their point of view, their agenda. Exactly. It happens to be all pro Trump. All pro Trump. Yeah. What a weird coincidence. Uh, and <laughs> on MSNBC, you've got people who have a different. Yeah. A point of view, which they express in prime time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello. OK. I, I, I kind of feel like one of the, one of the issues here, which the only point that I think that the people calling for various apologies kind of have here, which is not the point they're trying to make, is that a lot of people can't tell the difference between between the two. They They see the news. Coverage, they see the opinion coverage, and they, it blends oh, to yeah. blends together in a lot of ways. And I think that that's one thing right now at Fox. They're really trying to emphasize that wall between opinion and news. Um, but it's it's less a wall and more um, 
whatever the opposite of a wall is. <laughs> it's a door. Um, so you, you, you kind of see that float back and forth. So it's, it's hard to separate those two. And I think that the answer might actually be across the board to, to cut back on opinion programming. I get that it's hard to, it's hard to fill 24 hours worth of news. Um, or to reduce the number of panels. How many times do we need to watch people screaming at each other uh, on CNN or MSNBC or Fox? It's it's not helpful, and I think that it leads to it leads to people being uh, being confused and not understanding what is fact and what is opinion, and then distrusting distrusting the the press overall. Yeah, um, yeah, I push back on that a little okay. bit. First of all, I've. Sure. I've always been oh, yeah. an opinion journalist, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I was hired originally, I started my television career as a commentator. And all I can say is this, is that everywhere I've been, every, and, you know, for the two stations I worked for in Los Angeles and and the two cable networks I've, I've been worked for, MSNBC and CNN, I've always been identified as a commentator or a mm-hmm. contributor. Yes. Um, and I think you're right. Some people don't get that distinction, but they're pretty dumb if they don't. <laughs> and and almost every time I've, many times I've, if I appear, uh, there's somebody on the other side. I mean, so you get, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's back and forth, right? And so they the ought to see. And in the middle is your anchor, right? Yeah. Um, but um, there's so certainly I, a place I, for it. I'm, it yeah, yeah, and I, I think they're pretty clear trying to, to to let people know. I mean, I saw I noticed yesterday I saw I write a column for the Hill. And right at the top of the opinion page on the Hill, over my column and everybody else's column, is the views expressed by Bill yeah. Press are his views alone and not the Hill. Right. Yeah. Boom. Which, I think that's important. And I, I think what was something so, la- last year the New York Times redesign their opinion page so it looked different than mm-hmm. um, looked different than their straight reporting, which I thought was a really interesting approach to really try to visually change what it looks like. There is a theory out there that because Fox now bought um, the big the Fox Corp just bought the mm-hmm. I forget which studio one of the big studios right but at any rate and Lachlan Fox or Lachlan Murdoch has mm-hmm. sort of moved up and Rupert is not so much the chieftain of everything anymore that um, that Fox might become a little more independent, a little more critical of, of Donald Trump, be willing to do that. Trump about a week ago tweeted out about two Fox anchors in the middle of a Sunday afternoon that he didn't like. He thought they must have gotten their training at CNN, uh, <laughs> right? So... What are they doing on Fox? Why aren't they like Lou Dobbs? You know, um, is there? Do you see any change in a kinder, sure. gentler Fox? Oh, I, I wish, but I, I see. I, I don't see how that's possible right now. I when when you have, I, if if anything, I feel like Fox is getting more extreme over time. Really? Y- yeah. Because you you've got uh, you know especially <clears throat> Laura Ingram. You you watch her show, <laughs> and it just takes these. Uh, she comes back to a lot of these talking points that are really, really, uh, you know, she complains about identity politics as as a lot of Fox anchors do. But but when they're playing up these fears of fears of immigrants and, you know, this idea that people are going to be replaced, which is something that she's mentioned on her show a number of times, that's I, that's pretty extreme. And that I mean, that that is I, an identity based Point of point of view to put out there, so I don't see how you you have a kinder, gentler form of nationalism, which is <laughs> which is what you know what what that would be. So, what it, the Trump agenda is? Yeah, exactly. So I, I I feel like it's 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 hard to do that, especially when they're trying to still still currently trying to please Trump, their number one fan. You know, when he, when he when when they do straight news reporting, he complains that it's not like Lou Dobbs. Why aren't more people like Lou Dobbs or Steve Ducey or Laura Ingram or Tucker Carlson, and it's it's a it's a tough needle to to thread. I, I, I agree with that a hundred percent. I mean, we've we've done this show for a long time. We've we've been watching Fox News for a long time, right? And even going back to the days of Bill O'Reilly, uh, you know, Bill O'Reilly, a lot of bad takes, right? <laughs> Obviously, but they 
back in the day would stop short of actually putting out white nationalist ideas, right? They they knew how to say the quiet part mm -hmm. quietly. Yes. And now masks are off. You know, I mean, they, they, we say this all the time. They're saying the quiet part loud. They're just being very upfront. Uh, they are catering to white nationalism. They want that audience. They 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 don't try and hide from it. Mm -mm. Yeah. It's, it they have gotten so, it, which is remarkable because back fourteen years ago, uh, when we first started the show, they were really bad, and they've gotten exponentially <laughs> worse. Yeah, if if you go back and it's 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 kind of interesting to go back and and look at, for instance, if you if you go on the Media Matters website, look look at what was written ten years ago. It looks so tame by today's standards. You know, you you might see, oh, this this person had, uh, you know, uh, had got a fact wrong, or you know, something like that, mm -hmm. which which was yeah. notable at the time. But now it's we we do, everyone just sort of sort of assumes that there's going to be some straight up lying thrown in there, along with some incendiary viewpoints you, you mentioned uh, the personalities there i i thought it was funny uh, a couple of weeks ago where the president um gave everybody ratings based on how much <laughs> yes. they loved him yes. right and so th there were several people at fox who got a 10 like sean hannity got a 10 lou dobbs gets a 10 but steve Ducey got a 12, got a 12. <laughs> it was how much do you love me on a scale of one to 10 10 being the best Ducey was a twelve. <laughs> you know, and 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 what I, what I think is funny about that is 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 the fact that I'm 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 sure that Steve Ducey probably takes that with a point with oh, with with oh, pride. You oh, know, I bet no, you. no concern over the fact that hey, no. if the if it's the just, person whose news you're reading uh, thinks you're so great, maybe you're making a small mistake here or there. But you know, he seems pretty content with it. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I bet he, I bet he has that framed, and he's hanging in right over the mantle in his, in the <laughs> living room. At the same time, um, the one that surprised us, and we end up um, playing uh, bites of his often on the show, is Andrew Napolitano. Yes, Napolitano has become a pretty independent legal but analyst. I mean, it's interesting. He's still a conservative Republican, but on legal issues, he's been consistently pretty critical of the he's, he's willing to push back which i think is really interesting yeah. and i'm not sure if if it's so much that he's changed or that the that everyone else around him has has changed in the <laughs> other direction so um but yeah i mean he he is worth listening to he's he's one yeah. of those conservative viewpoints that is worth listening to and considering because you know i i think it is important to hear views that differ from your own uh, as long as they're as long as they're based in reality, like I can't, I can't, I can't, I don't see the benefit of entertaining some sort of bizarre white nationalist fantasy. Yeah. However, if someone wants to make the conservative legal argument for whatever, I am all on board for for watching that and listening to it. Now, I don't necessarily, I don't agree with him often, but I, I I do think that it's 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 a good thing that he's willing to push back a little bit on on others because you you see especially when when he'll appear on shows like um like outnumbered for instance he'll he'll appear on these shows and the co-hosts will will try to set him up to basically say you know agree with me on this and he'll he might say well not that far let's you know walk it back so are we to think better of fox now that donna brazil is a, a political commentator that's interesting. She did. Uh, I, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see what she does over the next uh, over the next few months. Um, but at at the same time, it's it's disappointing. I think in the in the sense that it it's hard to look at Fox right now overall and see anything other than uh, you know more or less propaganda, especially when it comes to their um, primetime shows. So she's appearing on these shows. I feel like when, when you're appearing on shows like Tucker Carlson or, you know, any any of the the other shows, uh, she was on Hannity, I think, the other night, which is really interesting because Hannity was one of the, uh, you know, one, one of the loudest voices criticizing, you know, her supposedly giving a question to mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton during the um, – mm -hmm primary um but but i i 
feel like those shows, it's it's tough because you don't want to legitimize uh, pro- propaganda. But at the same time, they also have two and a half million viewers a night. So you've, you've kind of got to balance that. I don't know if overall that makes her a net positive, a net negative on there. I think that she she brings a valuable viewpoint. Um, but I, I don't know if it's overall a good thing. And one, one thing I can say about Donna, Donna is not someone who is going to um, temper her views or pull oh, in right. her sails because of being on Fox News. Oh, absolutely. I mean, she'll, she'll, she'll say what she thinks. Oh, yeah. And, oh, and, and I fully believe that. Oh, I mean, yeah, I, totally. And she'll call them out if she yeah. dis- disagrees with them. So I, I, I think uh, I'm glad she's there. I'm not sure it's going to make a big difference in Fox overall. Uh, I do want to ask you about this before we run out of time here. Is so um, it's not just the media that's come under uh, attack for um, uh, for their giving any credence at all to the Mueller report. They seem to have focused in on Adam Schiff. Yep, yep. That's uh, which is interesting. He's demanding just doing his job. that he resign. He's just yeah. doing his job. Yeah. Um, and also, he knows more about uh, he knows more about what's going on than anyone at Fox, which is which also makes this. This really interesting, but I, I I feel like this push for apologies and a push for resignations, um, I don't know that it's necessarily a new trend, but it's certainly one that's picking up. Uh, it, it's it's picking up a lot of steam. It's you know you saw this happen a few weeks ago with uh, Representative Omar, um, where people right. were calling on her to step down from her her committee positions and. With um, Adam Schiff, you see sort of the sort of the same thing, and it's based on nothing really. I mean, they're they're really getting the message out there, and I think that's one of the things that that really sort of sort of uh, makes makes me uh, makes me wonder what's what's actually in this report. The the with the ferocity well, of of the pushback. Uh, hopefully, we'll find out soon. I think they want they're going after Adam Schiff because he's so good. And they want to get them out of the way. Yeah. Parker, thank you so much for coming in. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Melinda Markowitz, Chuck Collins, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cutting. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.